999ers risk their lives every day keeping us safe. We do this job to help people. But all too often, they're abused and attacked. The vehicle threw me like a rag doll. It should have killed me. These personal attacks on police, paramedics and firefighters are at an all-time high. Ah! I admit, I was absolutely terrified. We don't put on this uniform to be assaulted. Leaving them traumatised and unable to work. It felt like I was saying goodbye to my career. But while the violent criminals responsible are hunted down and brought to justice... Run, you do not to... Our protectors fight to get well and back on the job. I was not going to give up. There was no way. It took a hell of a lot of hard work to get back to the place I'm just now. Ready to face the next critical incident. Today, a hit and run leaves a police officer injured. But she's determined to get back on her feet. I am proud of how well I've done, not allowing anything to get me down. Fire crews across the UK head out on their busiest night of the year. Obviously, it's bonfire night tonight, so be extra vigilant. A night known for violence against firefighters. This is the exact place we went last year when we were attacked. And Saturday night revelry ends with a serious head injury for one police officer. One of the males hit me in the side of the head, and then the next moment I woke up and I was on the floor. Bedfordshire, PCs Hayley Robinson and Steve Busby have been working together for three years. I've not really wanted to do anything else, if I'm honest. I've been a frontline officer for most of my career. They make a great team and enjoy working together. But eight months ago, their teamwork was put to the ultimate test when one shift ended with Hayley needing emergency assistance and Steve doing everything he could to get her help. Watch out, he's trying to ram for Hayley. Get out. Today, they're watching the full body-worn footage for the first time since the incident. Look, it, it's pushed the car over that way, and it's right near the bushes now. He's now making off up towards the sand hills, but he's an ambulance. I think it's the unknown, isn't it, because you don't know what you've done. Yeah. I've got an injury. I've got to get to the hospital. I was in a lot of pain. I was just in the police car. My crewmate was blue-lighting me to hospital. That was that day. That day was on a shift eight months ago. Hayley and Steve got a call with concerns about a possible suicidal woman. Well, we'd received information that um, this lady was near a bridge um, going over the railway. Um, and there was obviously quite a concern for her that she'd, she'd taken an overdose and could potentially be quite ill. So. We were checking all the bridges, and there, there are quite a few bridges that go over the railway um, in Sandy. As they drive alongside the railway, they come across a car parked in the lane. We've done a track next to the railway line, a very scant, sporty car. Can you use the TNT vehicle, please, on Alpha Alpha? And at that point, I got out of our, of our panda just to go and speak to him to see if he'd seen the lady that we were looking for. I thought we were just going to wind down the window and speak to Hayley. But uh, he started the car up, put it into reverse. Um, and initially, I didn't think much of it. I just thought that he was moving out of the way for us. But I gestured to him to stop, and he put his foot down. He's just gone through a, a, a bar gate. He's going backwards. He's going to crash it, crash it into some barriers. And then he's reversing at ridiculous speeds, really, just all over the place. At that point, we were just, like, literally, what is happening, you know? Hayley and Steve give chase to the reversing vehicle, but suddenly it comes to a stop. I thought, you know, maybe the car's stuck uh, or he's given up. And then I went to get out of our car. And as I've done so, I've then seen the car coming at me. Realising they're in extreme danger, Steve switches on his body cam. It's crashed. <laughs> Watch out, he's trying to run for Hayley. And I've tried to get back in, but 
Unfortunately, he has rammed my door, which chucked my leg, and he's rammed our police car out of the way with, with my leg stuck in the door. Get out! Get your legs in! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's crashed, it's crashed, it's crashed your ankle! Eventually, he's took the pressure off my door and I've been able to kind of get myself in. And then he's proper rammed us out of the way then. And, and that's when he's managed to get past us and out of the way. And made off up the track. If she hadn't got back in the car, she had nowhere else to go. So he could have hit her and knocked her over. And in order to continue his journey, he would have had to go over the top of her. I didn't need an ambulance. <laughs> Making off. No, they're not doing camp, they've reversed it. They're coming out of Sundham, the road, and they're going to come out at the bottom of Cambridge Road. Get a unit to Cambridge Road. Yeah, to Cambridge Road, please. Yeah, can we have an Do you want me to drive, Hayley? I'm trying to give people uh, an idea where we are. We're in such an isolated area. Well, you'll never find me. I'm on a track. It runs right parallel with the railway line. We're on the Steve realises that waiting for help line. isn't an option. Um, yeah, get, get, get your leg in. Which le <laughs> it's got to be better if I get to hospital myself. <laughs> and then we've done a blue light run to Bedford Hospital. You can never put into words what the camera can show on the film. Later, as Haley is rushed to hospital, the police launch a manhunt to track down the runaway driver. And everybody was in the area trying to find the vehicle and where the people had run off to. Yeah, the driver was a white male. He had shortish, fairish hair, pale skin. It's bonfire night. And all over the UK, the fire service is preparing for one of the busiest nights of the year. In West Yorkshire, Sally Evers and her crew are starting their shift. Uh, evening. So I'm self in charge, firefighter scrimshaw driving. Uh, obviously, it's bonfire night tonight, so be extra vigilant. And, uh, this is the worst time of the year for attacks on firefighters. That's one of the first things that you always check when you get your rota for next year. Are we working? Yes, we're working bonfire night. And I get a sort of a, a sense of impending doom. Fingers crossed we don't have too much trouble this evening. But your duties fall out. My job's to look after people, it's to keep people safe. And at the end of the day, I'm not there to spoil your fun. I'm there to stop you getting hurt. Just down at Redbridge, yeah. large gangs of youths with masks and weapons are wandering oh, around. Great. The madness of bonfire night. <laughs> In Newcastle, Mark Barton and his crew have just started their shift with Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue Service. It's the 5th of November, which is inherently the busiest time of the year for any fire service, really. He and his crew have a long day ahead. Personally, it's um, significantly for myself is because on this date in the past, we have been subject to abuse, violence, and it's not a nice place to be in, to be honest. As an emergency service worker, you're there to help people, you're there to do, to do good for people. And when you're attacked, it just prevents you from doing your normal day-to-day -day work. Back in West Yorkshire, the calls have started coming in. 50 to 60 ewes in area, antisocial behaviour. Police attacked, missiles thrown. Yeah, it's all, all happening tonight. Last year, 
West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service attended over 280 incidents, with over 100 being bonfire or firework related. They also suffered a whopping 18 attacks over the bonfire weekend. We'll be under attack from fireworks. Can just get out of that area then? Yeah, it's not just one night anymore. It's it can be a fortnight. It's the week leading up to it, and it's the week following it. You can feel the atmosphere changing. They're deliberately setting fires in ridiculous places, and then the people who set the fires are calling us out because then they're lying in wait for us to arrive, and then we get attacked. I've had bricks, large stones bounce off the back of my helmet. It is so destroying, you know, and it's really, really frightening. Last year, firefighter Tom Marr was on board one of the engines when they were attacked. Pretty much every time I went out, we'd find that there were quite a substantial crowd of, of youths waiting for us and it became like a game of cat and mouse the, the fires were being relit in the same places we'd come up to where the fire had been reported and there'd be this huge crowd of people a lot of them had the faces covered up uh, which is really intimidating and then there were missiles thrown stones and fireworks as well in this footage a firefighter narrowly misses being hit by a firework aimed directly at him. It was tangible that we were disliked, and that was probably the thing that I thought was quite disturbing. These people obviously had a real problem with us and really saw us as the enemy. They mean us harm. All this footage was recorded by the West Yorkshire Fire Service throughout the last decade. It shows the type of attacks that the fire service is subjected to. Most of the time, we had to withdraw because it was simply too dangerous. We were demoralised on the way back. I mean, you do get quite a buzz when you've been able to make a real difference. You think, you know, I've done the job that I'm paid to do and this is what I joined for. There were none of that on the way back. We just felt like we hadn't achieved anything apart from dodging serious injury. For me, it's almost a little bit of anger as well, you know, because you know, what right have they got to attack me for doing and my crew for doing my job? Uh, it is, it, it's, it just makes me cross. Really, really angry, actually. Later, our crews hope it's not more of the same on this year's bonfire night. Who's in charge? Who's, who's the responsible one here? Assaults on emergency workers take all forms. Stabbings, strangulations and violence with many various weapons. But there's one form of attack that is particularly vile. And a surprising number of first responders are subjected to it. Sergeant Sean Underwood was the victim of such an attack. We had a call to a male who was on Stokes Croft in Bristol, um, being aggressive. Various members of the public called it in to us, saying that they were worried about him and people he was shouting and screaming at. When we first arrived, there was a lot of people around all looking to us to do something. So we had to try and calm him down and calm the situation down to stop other people worrying about what's going to happen next. We couldn't calm him down. He just wasn't seeing reason. He was still being aggressive. We had to take him down to the floor um, to try and safely restrain him in handcuffs to stop him hurting us and himself, in fairness, because he was flying himself around. He quite easily could have got hurt himself. And then we had to carry him to the police van, which is when the incident itself happened. As he was shouting, screaming, turned, looked at me in the face, and just a big spit came out of his mouth and 
straight into mine. Your immediate reaction is to just spit and drop and dr just try and get the horrible stuff out of your own mouth. Um, but we were obviously carrying him at the time as well, so we couldn't just drop him. We've taken him to the floor again just so we could sort ourselves out and I could try and uh, get the get it out of my system, if you like, as soon as I could. Although low, there is a risk of catching some diseases from saliva. It's just that sheer worry and immediate distress as what's just happened. I didn't want to catch anything, anything contagious that he may have had. I didn't want to pass any risk on to my family as well. I had a young family at home, um, a wife and two young children that I didn't want to go home and then start um, giving them a good night kiss and passing anything on. It's probably some, sometimes it's probably a bit irrational, but actually it was a real worry that what my kids going to get from this. It was essential. Sean was checked out immediately. So I ended up going to my GP the next day for, for various tests. After an anxious wait, Sean eventually got his results. I did get the all clear, and I didn't need any long-term medication. I didn't have, con didn't contract anything, so I had nothing long-term to worry about uh, physically. In fairness, in this situation, he was dealt with that court very quickly because he pleaded guilty straight away. The offender pleaded guilty to assaulting a police officer and also a separate earlier assault on a member of the public. He was ordered to pay £50 compensation to Sean and sentenced to 12 weeks in prison. The average member of the public wouldn't know what we go through um, on a daily basis sometimes. I certainly didn't before I joined the police. I didn't realise what life was like outside of my sort of bubble and what all emergency services workers go through sometimes, which is just the most disgusting behaviour and the, the most vile scenes and incidents that, unless you've been through it, you wouldn't know how it felt. Still to come. Bonfire night goes off with a bang. But when they're left unattended like this, we've got the option but the, but the extinguish the fire. And as pubs and clubs close on a Saturday night, an officer is brutally attacked. One of the males hit me in the side of the head. And then the next moment, I woke up and I was on the floor. Back in Bedfordshire, a runaway driver has rammed PC Hayley Robinson's car, crushing her ankle. Yeah, it's crashed, it's crashed, it's crashed her ankle. Get a unit to Cambridge Road. Stranded in a remote lane, her colleague Steve decides the best plan of action is to take her to hospital himself. Well, you'll never find me. I'm on a track. It runs right parallel with the railway line. It's got to be better if I get her to hospital myself. Be the police officer, you've got to make decisions and you've got to base them on what you're witnessing at the time. I was witnessing Hayley in pain. Hayley is in so much pain, Steve thinks it's best to move her into the back of the car. Yeah, she's in the back of my car with static Cambridge Road. I'm moving her into the back seat so she's more comfortable. Thank you. As they race to the hospital, Steve is on radio comms with police in the area, trying to help them track down the driver. I was listening to what was going on on the radio, where the car had gone, and I was able to give other units an idea roughly to where these people may have gone. Yeah, the driver was a white male. He had shortish, fairish hair, pale skin. The driver is spotted speeding through the centre of town. There was people everywhere. The schools had kicked out and, you know, the kids were walking home. It was quite busy in that area. And basically, he just lit, drove like a maniac um, through the town. Now we're leaving one people over in the middle of Sandy Market Square. And everybody was in the area trying to, to find the vehicle and where the people had run off to. With police cars across town joining the hunt, they soon find their getaway car. It wasn't long before we had the report. We've located the subject vehicle is on fire. The car had been set alight. Let's go ahead, where is it? 
found the car, Hayley. Yeah, it's on the heavy grade, it's heavy on the fire. Although the car has been located, the driver is not with it. He was eventually tracked down four months later and pleaded guilty to causing serious injury by dangerous driving. He was sentenced to two years in prison, received a two-year driving ban and was ordered to take an extended driving test. It was a massive relief, obviously, when I heard that he had been arrested. He's in prison, which is a good thing, because he's quite, quite a dangerous man, in my opinion. He deserves to be behind bars. With Haley in agony in the back seat, Steve makes it to the hospital in under 15 minutes. Well, it's awful. How could somebody inflict an injury to another human being like that, whether it's a police officer or another person, just to get away? This can, can never be justified. You were saying, well, you know, she's had a leg crossed by a car. All right, but hey, Hayley, I'm going to take you up the back. Can, can you get us a chair or a yeah, toilet? Do you want to go out this yeah. side or the other side? <laughs> two, two, three. They get, they get a trolley, they get a trolley. I got x-rayed at the hospital, obviously, and there was a break to the bottom of my fibula, just above the ankle. Are you right? OK? Oh, no. The actual break is probably not the worst of the injury itself, because there was a lot of soft tissue damage around both sides of the ankle bone, because uh, essentially my, my foot was, was sort of crushed in in the door, so... Haley's leg was put in a cast and she was told to rest it for at least five weeks. We have got a cord and VB, so Being unable to walk was particularly tough for Haley. It was horrendous, if I'm honest. Um, I live in, you know, quite a rural location. Um, obviously, I couldn't drive. I live by myself. Uh, I've got quite a lot of animals that, that need looking after. Um, and being in the cast was just a nightmare. I can't, you know, can't even begin to explain. Just doing the most menial thing was just so difficult, being on your own. Going back to work was out of the question for Haley, and caring for her animals was almost impossible. I couldn't do anything really for them, no. and they they did get a little bit sort of frustrated and a little bit like restless quite a lot of the time because you know they wanted to go out. They you know they're quite active dogs. I'm quite an active person. I do all sorts of all sorts of things. Um, I do love rugby. I love playing. I uh, love training, and also when I couldn't do that, it was like a massive chunk of my life just gone, sort of thing. It was quite difficult to, to sort of comprehend and, and deal with. And it wasn't just the physical injuries that had an impact on Hayley. I had, you know, a few nightmares, generally just trouble sleeping. I was obviously still in a lot of pain. It did affect me quite, you know, quite a lot, really. Thank you very much. It's like, you know, why did this happen? Um, what did I do wrong? You know, could I have done something differently? <laughs> but Haley isn't a woman to give up. After 10 long weeks, she was able to return to work on restricted duties. I'm a handcuff. And... You never would have hugged me before, I don't think. Oh, no, I'm not a huggy person, though, no, am I? No, no, exactly. Hey. But you have, you have given me a hug, which is nice. Yeah. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, you've only got your colleagues to rely on, you know? Yeah, we're like one big family, aren't we? Sometimes. <laughs> oh, I couldn't wait to get back to work. You can work fine, not that one. <laughs> A 
as part of her recovery. Steve and Haley are visiting the scene of the crime for the first time since the incident happened. There you go. Being here again, she realises how much worse things could have been. I've opened my door and I've almost kind of here and then I've seen the car moving. So I've then tried to get myself back in and he's... I was too slow, whatever. And then he's, um, he's basically then rammed the door. My foot has kind of been like there as he's been pushing it. Obviously, it's a memory, isn't it? Just coming back and like, reliving everything, and it's almost like it's almost unreal. It's like it didn't happen to me. How weird. You know, you, you've got to be quite a special kind of person anyway to do the job, but there you do find little weird things to help you cope with stuff. Well, we've had lots of support. We've had lots of lots of people yeah, contact us. Yeah, all our colleagues have been really supportive, haven't yeah. they? That night we had high ranking, ranking officers just ringing us and mm -hmm. make sure he was OK. You know, just that one phone call just makes all the difference. You won't forget it, will you? Oh, God, no. Absolutely mm. not. You won't forget it'll be one of them events that has to remember for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, I won't forget that. I don't think of anything else for Hayley, I'll always remember her broken leg. <laughs> oh, I, think, I, I like to think you remember me for more than that. <laughs> for the good bits as well. <laughs> <laughs> All the good times we had. Yeah. You know, we care about each other, but we do this job because we care about people. It was good to be back in uniform and back in, you know, back at work, so... And the dogs are delighted too. I don't know what it is about walking dogs, but it's just it's so much peace. You know, just so much time to think and just enjoy, like, playing and enjoy the countryside and the weather. Yeah, I did push myself really hard. So, yeah, I am, I am proud of how well I've done, because you know, a lot of people have said to me, you know, they can't believe how quickly I, I went back to work and, and that is, you know, that's just me as a person, just not allowing anything to get me down and stop me from doing what I enjoy doing. And one thing Hayley really enjoys doing is getting out on the rugby pitch. I'm very happy to be back here. Um, place is just amazing. I love all the girls and I love playing for the team and um, yeah I'm so happy to be back here. I'm ready right. and, and strong enough to get out there. Yes, Let's do the capture. Oh, it just feels amazing. <laughs> again, again! In Gloucester, Inspector Sarah Sleeman and her team are about to go on the beat. That female on there was terrible last week. The one that bit this door staff. Yeah. It's Saturday, and the busiest night of the week for the city's pubs and clubs. And they reported burglary. It wasn't the burglary, so they basically just jumped over the, the thing to the smoking area. For the police, safety on the streets is paramount. <laughs> OK, so tonight we're, I'm on a street safety duty, which is from nine at night to all five in the morning. I'm actually working until two and we have a group of specials who've joined us for this evening, so we've got quite a few members of staff. The Saturday night shift is a difficult one for Sarah. It means going back to the street where she was the victim of a vicious attack in 2015. And they're not long out when Sarah spots some potential trouble. Stop it, stop it, no, stop it. No, no. Stop it. I don't know what's going on, pack it in. Although this situation is resolved quickly, three years ago, Sarah wasn't so lucky. 
we were stood just outside the, the main nightclub, which closes at the latest time. Some of us on one side of the road and others on the other side of the road. Two males had come out of the club and they weren't doing anything illegal, but they were pushing each other around and looked like that they could cause some trouble. And then out of the club, a young girl came out and she went straight up to the two males and started shouting at them and was inflaming the situation. I went to step in to speak to the young girl and she pushed me in my chest, just causing me to step back once. I took hold of her and started chatting to her and saying, you know, you need to leave the area because you're causing a disturbance. A nearby CCTV camera picks up the altercation. As I was walking away, one of the males hit me in the side of the head. And then the next moment I woke up and I was on the floor. Sarah's colleague immediately calls for backup. Rachel Lynch Warden was the duty inspector that night. The emergency button activated on my radio, saying that an officer had been assaulted um, and that it was quite a serious assault. Within a few seconds, I knew that it was Sarah, which was personally quite upsetting. One of my colleagues who was with me was saying to me, stay down, stay down, because I was trying to get up. And as I was trying to get up, I could also feel something pouring out the side of my head. I put my hand onto my head and looked at my fingers and said to my colleague, I think I'm bleeding. I knew it was quite a nasty assault, but I was quite shocked when I saw her. My friend was shouting to some other people to get some bandages, and then she was trying to bandage my head up, but it was pouring through the bandages, and then she was panicking, and that was making me get more and more panicked. And she had a big bandage around her head. It was covered in blood. She was completely gray. Um, she looked really, really shocked. Um, she was struggling to um, explain what had happened. Um, she was quite upset, which is not normal for her at all. And as I was lying in the street, people were still pouring out of the nightclub and there were fights erupting all around. With the heavy bleeding a real concern, Sarah is rushed to hospital. They found a cut on my head and I had my had it glued um, because it was like a, a moon shape. So it's all down all the way down to my skull, but it was in a moon shape, so they were able to stick it back down. Since after the event I learned that he had a mobile phone in his hand, which actually he smashed when it hit my head. He came up behind me and like from the side and hit my head with it in his hands. It was a vicious attack. It was extremely vicious and he knocked her unconscious. Um, I don't see how you can view that as anything other than appalling, really. Um, and I was quite upset when I saw her in the hospital. Purely from a professional point of view, because it was one of my staff and I felt that very personally. Um, from a personal point of view, because She's my friend, and it's horrible to see a friend in that situation. I was in hospital for a couple of hours, then I was released because I told them I wasn't knocked out. <laughs> um, because I needed to go home, really, because I've got children at home, and there were lots of things planned for that day, and I just wanted to go home and be with my family. The offender was charged with actual bodily harm and sentenced to nine months in prison, suspended for 18. I think that if you hit a police officer, that you make that decision and the consequences should be that you should go to prison because I was walking away from him. He didn't have to come and punch me in the side of the head. He made that decision. The weeks following the attack were very stressful for Sarah, and she was off work for a month. When I was at home, I was in quite a lot of pain by that, that time, and also the fact that I was feeling dizzy. I was just feeling that would I be able to go back to work again? Um, did I want to go back to work again? I also had lo lots of trepidation as to whether or not I could do my role anymore. Could I actually go out into the streets and just walk around and be a police officer again? Because it was a head injury, it heals quite quickly. It was more of a mental rather than a physical journey as far as coming back to work was concerned. When I first came back, I'd seen our occupational health here and made sure that I was mentally fit to do my job. 
four weeks away from frontline policing and Sarah returned to work. I probably am a different person. I'm more wary of people. Um, I'd be more wary in, in the street where it happened. I just find that because the person who attacked me attacked me from behind, I'm very nervous of people coming up from behind me, so if anyone does, I have to sort of turn around and speak to them and make sure that they're just going to pass me by rather than, you know, knock me in the head again. But despite being cautious, Sarah knew she didn't want to let the attack beat her. And as tonight shows, she's managed to overcome her fears, even when patrolling the same street. Yeah, at the moment, it's reasonably quiet and... Everyone's quite good-natured, aren't they? <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Are you only partying until half twelve? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had to celebrate my 50th. Oh, <laughs> it was very impressive that she came back a few weeks later and was back doing the same job again. We don't really want to arrest people. We just want people to have a good night and go home and get home safely. We don't want to spoil people's evenings and lives by arresting them. So most of the time we're just trying to, you know, give them a few words of advice and say, right, just leave the area and go home. Ah, that's it. I enjoy doing this type of work because it's the most fun bit of being a police officer because you get to meet people and have a chat with them. So yeah, it's been a good night. Attacks on police on city streets are sadly quite commonplace. But even the confines of the police station can't always keep officers safe. In this clip, an apparently drunk suspect is leaning against a wall in a Leicestershire police station, supported by two officers. But as they go to lead him away, he suddenly comes to life and throws a punch so hard it knocks the officer to the ground. He's immediately brought down, and there's no way these officers are letting him do something like that again. This shocking incident shows how assaults can happen, even when they're least expected. Back in Newcastle, the fire department are getting ready for the busiest night of the year, bonfire night. Mark Barton and his team are preparing for another night of terror. It's not long before the first call comes in, with reports of an unattended bonfire. And while the call-out doesn't sound particularly threatening, Mark has reason to be worried. We're putting out the fire here at the same time last year, and there was youths on the other side, the fire and firewood. This bonfire is in the exact same place where last year Mark and his crew came under attack. It was about 9, nine 10 o'clock at night. In a residential area on a bit of grassed, grassed area, and there was youths in the area, and there was members of the public in the area as well. So initially, it, there wasn't a great deal of concern, should we say. The police were already in attendance, which is always something that we look for on, when there's groups of youths around. Everything seemed like a normal job, to be honest, until when I was speaking to one of the police officers, a firework like exploded between them. <laughs> At that point, the dynamics of the incident changed within seconds. Mark had a representative from the fire services press team out with him that night. You could really sense that the atmosphere had changed from something that was going to be quite celebratory to something that suddenly had some menace about it. And the youths just came continually bombarded with the fireworks from start to finish. It was a prolonged attack for about 15 minutes, landing within feet of firefighters, members of the public. There was young kids there, there were people carrying babies in their arms and there was rockets flying past them, landing hedges. My primary concern was to move them to the place of safety. I suddenly realised that this was quite an unnerving situation. I couldn't understand why people would do this. Unfortunately, it's not something we're all unaccustomed to. It, it happens on a regular basis. 
you know, these are the people who could be saving your mum, dad, best mate from a fire. It's upsetting. Some people don't, don't realise, like, the nature of why we're at incidents. It's uh, we're only there primarily to, to help people, to save people's life, protect property. And it can be sort of frustrating because it does happen on a regular occurrence. So it's no surprise that one year later, Mark and his crew are a bit apprehensive as they arrive at the exact same spot. You've got to be thinking on your feet constantly because you're in a rapidly changing environment. They quickly put out the bonfire, but with people hanging around, Mark doesn't want to leave just yet. So here's you in the area. So I've got to, I've got to now keep an eye on them. It's that side of it again, as long as you've got adults here, and somebody who's going to take responsibility, then if the fire brigade turn up, they can just let us dance lines with somebody here. You kind of just leave them unattended. But I'll help, right? All right. We're not here to spoil anybody's fun, but when they're left unattended like this, we've got the option for the, for the extinguish the fire. Satisfied that the situation is under control, the crew head back to the station to await the next call. Yeah, it's, um, that's the first one out of the way. First of many. <laughs> Brilliant. Over in West Yorkshire, Sally and her crew are having a quieter night than expected. From my point of view, the night's gone uh, relatively smoothly, but there are crews out there who've, who've had a tougher evening than we have. Broadway Avenue, 30 yards. That's so Throwing fireworks, firing alleyway. Now a little large fire, then it's going over a garage and spread to garden. Yeah. We've been in and out, we've had a few jobs. Nothing too horrific or unpleasant, fortunately. And Mark's feeling pretty positive too. He's attended a few more bonfires. As long as it's away from any sort of risk, any builds, anything like that, and there's adults there. That's a thief. Who's in charge here? Who's, who's the responsible one here? Keep it on the other side, I so it's away from the trees. Right, no problem. There's been plenty of fireworks. But this year, no attacks. If we've got to worry about mindless attacks on firefighters, it takes away from our primary focus, which is to save life. I'll never stop loving my job. You know, I really, really enjoy it. It's massively rewarding. Even on the worst day, there's something that makes you smile.